Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jen Elder. I am the director of the SAMHSA Homeless and Housing Resource Center. I apologize for the slight delay in getting started today. We wanted to make sure that everything was set. So we are gonna do a little bit of housekeeping while everybody gets into the room. So welcome, we're so glad to have you. Um, next slide. So welcome to our webinar today, Whole Person Care for People Experiencing Homelessness and Opioid Use Disorder. We are joined by a wonderful panel. We're gonna have a great 90 minutes together today. Next slide. A quick disclaimer before we begin, we are funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, um, but the views are uh, solely of us, the presenters and authors today, um, and not of the, um, of SAMHSA or HHS. Next slide. As you see, we do have American Sign Language interpretation today. Uh, we are so glad to be joined by Justin and Jennifer, um, and who you'll see in the window. We also have live transcription where you can click the closed captioning and uh, show the subtitles on your screen. If you have any uh, difficulties today, please contact us at our email address. Next slide. So all participant lines should be muted. We'll double check that that's the case because we have so many great people joining us today. We'll have a recording available on our website along with the slides um, shortly at hhrctraining.org. Please submit your questions to us through the Q&A feature. Um, we'll get to as many of those today as we can. We also will have an evaluation. Um, we'll make sure that you get the link for that uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, your browser should reject you just in case. We'll make sure you have that. And we will offer a certificate of participation um, for those completing the survey. Next slide. So today we're excited to uh, unveil and discuss um, our new whole person care for people experiencing homelessness and opioid use disorder toolkit part one, um, that is available now on our website. Scroll down to the toolkit section and that'll be right there for you. We're also gonna discuss the key principles of whole person care, including trauma-informed care and person-centered techniques, um, and identify practical strategies to incorporate into your work. One of the things I am personally most excited about today is hearing from a wonderful panel who is gonna talk about uh, all of their lessons learned, practical strategies. We're gonna get you know, some wonderful real talk today in this webinar. Next slide. So with that, uh, we have a great panelist of presenters. I will let them introduce themselves more fully and we will have their full biographies on our website. But we're joined by Steven Samra and Ken Craybill um, from C4 Innovations who helped develop the toolkit and this webinar. Also Joel J.C. Smith, who's a certified peer recovery specialist with the VA Gulf Coast Veterans Healthcare System and Raquel Garcia, the CEO of Hard Beauty. So they will, you will get to know them a lot more throughout this presentation. Just encourage you to send us your thoughts and your questions as we get going. And I think with the next slide, I might be handing it off to uh, Stephen and Ken. Fantastic, Jen. Thank you so much for, for having us. Um, just a, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. And this is such an important toolkit. Um, it, it's just really, really exciting. And I want to welcome everybody. I'm Stephen Samra. And as Jen said, I'm joined by my colleagues, Raquel Garcia, JC Smith, and Ken Craville. Um, and we're here to take you through a sampling of this new resource and then share some insight into really how the, you know, the, the content development occurred. Um, we're going to finish with a facilitated and moderated conversation that's going to explore more of the toolkit, um, and it will be accompanied by some of our own examples and discussions that really led to the finished product that, that you're, you now have access to. Um, we wanted to first frame the issue and the challenge. So bear with us as we move through these slides. We'll get you all past this pretty quickly and into the conversation, which I hope is going to provide both insight into the toolkit as well as the uh, rationale for why we did, the, uh, did it the way we did. So here, what I wanted to do is make sure that folks understood the scope of the problem, essentially. And from 2013 to 2019, 
you know, we the, we know that the age adjusted rate of deaths involving synthetic opioids, other than methadone, increased 1,040 percent, and for stimulants, it increased 317 percent. Death rates involving prescription opioids and heroin increased in the presence of synthetic opioids. That is a key point. They increased in the presence of synthetic opioids, but not in their absence. Clearly, illicit fentanyl, carfentanyl, these things are killing our brothers and sisters out there. Sharp increases in synthetic opioid and stimulant-involved overdoses uh, in 2019, they're consistent with recent trends, and they're saying we have a worsening and expanding drug overdose epidemic. Opioid use has, uh, has risen to a level of a national crisis as the number of people misusing prescription drugs and heroin have dramatically risen, and the rate of opioid-related overdose deaths have tripled since 2000. And unfortunately, but predictably, the nation's COVID pandemic made the nation's drug overdose epidemic that much worse. The AMA, uh, the AMA released an issue brief on August 4th of this year, and it highlights media and other reports showing increases in drug overdose mortality and other concerns relating to access to evidence-based care for substance use disorders, patients with pain, and harm reduction services. So risk factors are all negatively associated with health status here, and there's a complex and reciprocal association between social factors and illicit drug use. Um, homelessness, for example, is a really complex problem and it occurs for a lot of different reasons. Uh, some people may turn later to addiction as a means to cope with their lack of a, of a fixed home, but it can be difficult to determine how much substance misuse leads to homelessness compared with the frequency by which homelessness leads to substance misuse. Drug misuse can cause social disadvantage, socioeconomic disadvantage, and often can lead to dependence. And in addition, the risk factors associated with drug misuse often lead to other adverse outcomes like poor physical or mental health, criminal justice involvement, or even risky sexual behavior. Now, as the coronavirus pandemic has sort of taken hold, folks with substance use disorders are more likely to be exposed to the virus and they'll have higher hospitalization and mortality rates as a result of COVID. In one study, the odds of exposure to COVID for those with a substance use disorder, almost nine times higher than those without a substance use disorder. And folks that are experiencing an opioid use disorder are at the highest risk. And some factors especially important among those with, with opioid use disorder include employment, obviously, housing, education, transportation, trauma, social support, stigma, criminal justice involvement, and access to technology. Another study found that those with, with substance use disorders were at increased risk for hospitalization, ventilation use, and mortality compared to those folks who don't have an SUD. And finally, minority populations have been especially hard hit by the convergence of SUD and the pandemic. And unfortunately, um, social determinants of health have been implicated as one of the reasons for this differential impact. The impact of internalized or micro stigma, it creates a vicious cycle of substance use. And you know, stigma is the number one reason people don't come in for treatment. And in rural areas, it's even worse. And so it's, it was really important that this toolkit examines the impact of stigma and efforts to reduce or eliminate it. So what you see here is just a rationale for targeting that whole person. Uh, we know upstream systemic barriers and burdens contribute to downstream medical causes of high morbidity and mortality of people experiencing homelessness. And we also know that downstream causes magnify and exacerbate the negative effects of those upstream causes. And because of this, it's really critical that care for people experiencing homelessness, it's got to address um, the intersecting health and social burdens. Um, and we do that by combining health-related and social interventions for people experiencing homelessness. 
So we've included some general practical tips that came from uh, the Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Um, and it's a way to provide some additional strategies for improving outcomes, improving access to uh, you know, evidence-based medications, access to competent and quality psychosocial services, and moving social work forward in ways that help address and uh, the challenges that people with opioid use disorder and with homelessness face. Ah, yes, here it is in all its glory. And you should have that link um, to the new toolkit. So what we're gonna do now is just take a really brief tour through it and I'll get you on to the, you know, to the more important stuff here um, around the conversation. But trust me when I tell you, as you look through this toolkit, this really is the important stuff. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about it, but uh, this is a labor of love and passion by a whole lot of folks. Um, and as you look at it, the table of contents is robust. Um, and it is broken into five different sections or modules. It starts with a welcome, discusses whole person's, uh, person cares framework for supporting recovery. Uh, it then provides a solid overview of homelessness and opioid use disorder, how they intersect and how our systems aren't really yet set up to handle that. The toolkit then moves into supporting recovery and what that actually entails. And it finishes with the review of whole person care best practices. As I mentioned, it is robust and we tried to make it really thorough. Here again are the content sections. I just left off module one, the welcome uh, on this slide, but I've also included a call out box and we did a lot of them where we provided some reflection questions just as part of the toolkit's content and to break up some of the, you know, just breaking up some of the text as well. Stigma, I already talked about it before. It is so pernicious and so prevalent that it really requires a full understanding of its impact and more importantly, ways to reduce or eliminate it. We can't forget that stigma is really one of the primary reasons, if not the number one reason that people just don't come for treatment. We also need to focus on not just cultural competency, but cultural proficiency and cultural humility. Um, and it's important that we, with that, we focus on equity and equitable outcomes for marginalized populations. We also know trauma is prevalent in so many of the folks we serve. Um, a discussion on trauma and healing centered approaches, it's a must. And we've also tried to provide some definitions and call out boxes to really further clarify and kind of push the importance of these approaches and strategies. And harm reduction here is a critically, uh, a critically important component of engaging and supporting those with opioid use disorder who are experiencing homelessness. And again, here in the call out box, we've got some tips, strategies, and approaches. Uh, again, around a variety of areas. This one is core elements of effective street outreach. And no toolkit on opioid use disorder and homelessness would be complete without a discussion on motivational inter interviewing. So, of course it's here. Um, there's a lot more in this toolkit that I haven't mentioned, uh, but now you have it and you can explore it as you see fit. But more importantly, we're all hoping that you not only explore it, but you use it to help improve or refine or even challenge some of the methods and approaches you're currently using. As I said earlier, it was, and it is a labor of love from everybody who, who had anything to do with this, um, and, and because the majority of us who did put the, the actual toolkit together have experienced homelessness, substance use disorders, opioid use disorders, and are people in recovery, it's particularly um, passionate for us. So let's spend the rest of our time today talking directly to the folks who gave you the very best they could bring to the table regarding outreach and recovery support uh, to people with OUD and who are also experiencing homelessness. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Ken Cradle. Ken? Thank you, Stephen. And uh, if we can remove the slides, we'll have a view of one another here. Hello all. I am uh, delighted to be with you. Stephen, wonderful job on providing a, an overview of uh, and a, a, a toolkit that's, that's got a lot of extensive information in it. Um, just by way of brief introduction, I am a social worker by training. I have to tell you, I stumbled into working in homelessness back in the early 18, 1980s and uh, 
found it to be my calling. But one of the things that was really clear to me is that when I first started working in homelessness, we were doing a lot of flying by the seat of our pants in terms of how to proceed and how to help people. And I think, you know, I, I came with a lot of kindness and compassion, but not a lot of skill. And then along the way, lots of best practices have emerged, including trauma-informed care, motivational interviewing, and then the peer movement, which was so pivotal in all of this and uh, so much more. So in some ways, what this toolkit does is brings together a lot of the, the best experience and learning and research that we have to date in working with people who are marginalized and in this particular case, experiencing homelessness and OUD. So my role here today is to really be kind of the host who will pose some questions and then invite Raquel and Stephen and JC to respond to those things. And in the midst of all of that, we invite you also to raise questions in the Q&A box. And as some of you have noted, the chat box is not actually uh, something we're going to be using, uh, but we'll be looking in the Q&A box. So feel free to pose any questions along the way. Uh, we will try to incorporate responses to at least some of them, depending on how many come in and include you as best as possible in this conversation. So for starters, and I think what we'll do is uh, have Stephen, you and Raquel and JC introduce yourselves in the context of this first question I'm gonna ask, okay? So the toolkit itself invites us to consider a number of aspects of what it means to provide whole person care for people experiencing homelessness and opiate use disorder opioid use disorder. And, and if we reduce the content of the toolkit to an even shorter time frame than Stephen just provided for us, let's say we made it into a 10 second elevator speech, we would maybe say it's about helping care providers be as possible, uh, as, as person-centered as possible to be trauma-informed, recovery-oriented, racially equitable, non-stigmatizing and housing focused while embodying the heart set and the mindset of partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation, which of course uh, we, we totally ripped off from motivational interviewing. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of you in the order that you choose to please translate all of that verbiage for folks on this call and, and talk to us about what resonates most for you or what you're most passionate about in, in all of this uh, toolkit content that we have. Who would like to start? I'll go ahead and step up. Hi everyone, my name is Raquel Garcia. Um, and what speaks to me is acceptance and compassion and evocation. My name is Raquel and I've actually am a person who experiences, um, I'm in long-term recovery. I've been sober over 11 and a half years. And what speaks to me is the evocation piece because I always think about what's possible. Um, I think it was a key part to me uh, that people may have missed with me when I first stepped into recovery um, about what's possible beyond just putting down the substances, what's possible when we um, make different changes in our lives. Um, and it's one thing that I definitely focus on, especially, and also the racial, <laughs> Um, equity piece and um, non-stigmatization. Um, we often talk about I'm biracial and I am very expressive. JC and I like to share this thing, very expressive people and how sometimes that could be misunderstood as someone who is angry or frustrated when I'm just very expressive and passionate because I am a very passionate person, um, especially when it comes to this work. So what speaks to me is all of the, uh, I love what you talked about, the technicalities and the skill set, but my favorite part is the heart set um, and that set of partnership when I'm working with someone. I don't feel like I am ahead of them. I feel like I'm sitting next to them. And so that's a very important piece for me. Um, I'm J.C. Smith, and uh, if I could follow up, a little bit with what Raquel was saying. Um, I also like to add that Raquel can also speak very expressively without saying anything. But anyway, I digress. 
Um, I started my path uh, pretty much as uh, outreach for a, uh, a veterans, a homeless veterans outreach uh, service center in Nashville, Tennessee. And as a part of that, I, I, I brought with me um, a lot of my recovery. That's what opened that door up for me. Um, having uh, had recovery now for so many years, I think my recovery date is October the 10th. Don't think. My recovery date is October the 10th, 1994. Um, I brought that to the table with me. And also, I never realized how much, uh, how effective that could be when dealing with other people with other issues, especially when we're talking about mental health and trauma and, and uh, you know, opioid use or, or substance abuse disorders. Um, what I did was I, I kind of incorporated all of the bad things that happened to me and the, and the traumas that I had gone through were actually the bridge that gave me the connection to those out there who I was trying to get help for, who I was outreaching to. And so these things are what really uh, separated uh, the man on the street, so to speak, than the doctor in the clinic. Uh, even though they're so very much necessary, in order to get that connection to start out with, we have to have some form of safety. And people have been finding safety and similarity for eons. And so that's what brought me to the table. And, uh, and I think with that kind of compassion, <clears throat> excuse me, and empathy, uh, we could probably do a lot more successful work in this field. JC and Raquel, thank you. That was beautifully stated, both of you. Um, folks, I, my name is Stephen Samra. Uh, I, I am a, I'm in long-term recovery from the big five of behavioral health challenges. I, I have a primary diagnosis of an opioid use disorder, and I've spent plenty of time homeless. I've lived in a few camps and and you know just existed on the street. I mean, I also have some some mental health challenges uh, that I use medication for. I use medication for my opioid use disorder as well. Um, so, as I'm thinking about you know this this question, uh, I, what I can remember there, there's a couple of things that that really stand out to me. Um, and and the, I think the biggest one is. That you know, after I entered treatment and, and started on a you know medication assisted treatment program, um, it it opened the door for me. It really, what it did was allowed me enough stability um, so that I could devote my time to things other than chasing the bag of dope. And when that happened to me, I was able to get a bachelor's and then I went and got a master's degree. And I was really excited because I felt like those things would help me um, sort of get beyond all of the bad things that I'd done in active addiction while I was experiencing homelessness and, you know, et cetera. And so I, I was looking for a job and I had recently moved to Nashville. Um, that's how I met JC. Uh, but I'd moved to Nashville and I was uh, perusing the one ads and there was a there was a one ad that said, um, you know, we, we need somebody to do street outreach. You know, they, they talked a little bit about it. And what really stuck out for me was it sat at the very bottom. People with the history uh, or experience of homelessness encouraged to apply. That was awesome. And I thought, you know what, you know, this is, yeah, I, re I really like this. I went and applied and I, I ended up getting the job. Um, and the way that I got the job was that in the, you know, in the discussion interview, um, we ended up at a day shelter. And when I walked into the day shelter, now you have to remember, I was in a, I was going for an interview, folks, right? And I, I mean, I was in a suit. I mean, I, I was dressed to the nines, um, which today, when I think about the position I was trying to get, probably not the smartest way to go at it. But in any event, I'm dressed in this suit and I show up at a day shelter and at lunchtime. And so all my brothers and sisters are in there eating and, you know, it's a, it was boisterous and noisy. And <clears throat> excuse me, what I realized almost instantly when I walked in there was, I looked around at everybody and I thought, 
oh my gosh, um, these are all people who I just was in the same boat with. And I'm only out of that boat a little bit in learning how to row. Um, and how can I help? What, what is it that I can do? And from that moment, honestly, I knew what I, I was supposed to do. I was supposed to be telling my brothers and my sisters what I saw. And, and I, that's what I've done. Um, and so when I think about the, you know, the, the expansiveness of the, the uh, introductory question that, that Ken provided, right? Person-centered, trauma-informed, strengths, you know, the, the mantra that, that many of us use um, to describe the work that we do it described my life and it described how I came into recovery and it described all of my brothers and sisters around me and how I was going to be engaging with them. And the big thing that I realized, and, and I'll stop it, you know, when I, when I share this, but the biggest thing that I realized as I started engaging and, you know, I was talking about the, you know, the, you know, my own experiences on the street and what that was like and, and people, you know, we were all just engaging and really doing some, you know, some serious peer work. And I, at the time, I didn't really realize it was peer work, but that's really what we were doing. And I realized that um, I had taken the worst liabilities of my entire life, prison, addiction, uh, you know, trauma, the very worst things in my life, and I had turned them into my greatest assets. And those assets are what I share every day. It's what I put into the toolkit. It's what I put into the work I do. It's what I put into my family. And it's what I put into my brothers and sisters who were struggling to find recovery. So I'm really pleased to be here. Steve, I, I, you, you motivated me to add one thing. You brought it back to mind. And that is, is we are survivors. And as a survivor, I learned very early on in recovery that there was a certain amount of service that went into that. There was a certain amount of payback. Um, and we called it gratitude. And gratitude being that action word, I had to go out and do something to show that I deserved and earned my recovery, my, my survival. And, uh, and you expressed that so beautifully because, you know, being a survivor and reaching back to help other survivors only strengthens our resolve, only makes us better for what we try to do every day. And so I really appreciate you saying that. It really brought a lot. To That's all I wanted I, to say. All right. I got one more because, you know, we're going to go one more for this because what I, it came up for me was I no longer had to hide. I would hid my whole life. I'd hid every trauma. I'd hid everything that ever happened to me, every feeling. And for the first time in my life, I didn't have to hide this piece. And I was free. I have never had any autonomy in my recovery. I've lived recovery out loud since the day I walked out of treatment. And there is a freedom that comes from that. Um, and so, yeah, that came up for me is that I just didn't have to hide anymore. You know, I listened to all of this and, and the incredible passion and realness of it all just, just, uh, just washes over me in a way that is is so beautiful and how each of you have kind of experienced your own trauma in a variety of ways but have also kind of created a, a certain post-traumatic growth out of that uh, you've all taken what you've experienced and you went through hell and back but you've also learned how to, to use that in a way to give back, as you said, JC, and, and it's a beautiful thing. I wanna actually follow up a little bit, uh, and, and that is uh, maybe ask you what advice you might give or what tips you would give to people who come to outreach who don't necessarily have that lived experience. And I'm sorry, I'm going off script if you thought you knew what I was gonna be asking you, so, <laughs> but it's a conversation, uh, but just, Curious what, what you might say to people like myself, for example, who um, I, I love outreach, I'm passionate about it, but I, I don't bring that same kind of lived experience, which I think is so uh, animating to everything that you do. So just curious what your response would be. So, so Ken, I'm, I'll jump in on this one, you know, to, to kind of kick it off. But for me, um, 
it doesn't matter whether or not you've got the lived experience of homelessness to engage with people in, in outreach. The lived experience of homelessness certainly helps in terms of, you know, building some quick credibility, uh, you know, identifying ways to engage that folks who have never been homeless probably wouldn't even think about. Um, but, but in my mind, what it is really, um, it, and I think, you know, you mentioned it earlier, it's, it's around compassion, it's around caring, it's around, um, you know, wanting to uh, j just, you know, wanting all of us to, you know, to, to live a, a better, more satisfying and productive life in our community. And, and to do that in terms of, you know, outreach and engagement, what I would tell folks is in, in very basic terms, um, first, suspend your judgment. I get that, you know, you'll have bias. We all do. And I understand that. And I'm not asking you to remove your bias. I'm just asking you to set it aside long enough to have a conversation with somebody that uh, you may be able to use in a way that really supports and, and assists them. That's a huge one. Um, the other one for me is always under promise and over deliver because so many of us have been approached by really well-meaning outreach workers and that we've been told they're going to bring us basically a semi-trailer full of goodies and they never show up and we never see them again. And, and that's, if you want to talk about having your hope destroyed, that's a really fast way to do it. And then the final thing I'll just say is, and I know this is going to be difficult for some folks to, to kind of swallow, you can never give up on anybody. You can't give up. You never know. Listen, it took me 10 years of active contemplation and active addiction before I entered recovery. And I knew what my my addiction lifestyle was doing to me and everybody around me. And it still took me 10 years. Can't tell you what the, you know, what the conversation was that got me there. Um, but my point is don't ever give up. Um, you don't know what might be the final catalyst that moves somebody into recovery. So Steve, I, I, Man, I love it when you talk because you connect with me so well. And I guess it's probably because we know each other. So it's almost like I, I know where you're going. Um, for me, you were saying you don't necessarily have to have that lived experience. That lived experience is only one tool in the toolkit. Because <clears throat> I've known so many people who were so very successful. And I believe their success was based on their empathy. It was based on the fact that they established a safe place, a safe environment for whomever they may have been trying to connect with. Uh, it doesn't need, necessarily need you to be uh, of a similar background to understand that anybody out there in, in a homeless situation is, is facing a very traumatic lifestyle. And so the first order should be how can I make you feel safe so you can connect, so I can help you? Because if we don't get past that one little hurdle, then nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to be established. And so, yes, man, uh, you definitely don't have to have lived experience. Uh, but I tell you what, lived experience is kind of like having the hammer, you know, when you know, you, you probably have a whole set of tools, but you don't have a hammer. If you got a hammer with it, you really got some stuff, man. <laughs> That's all. Well, and if and, and JC, if you don't, if you don't have the hammer, maybe your friend has the hammer, right? Like maybe I don't have the story, but maybe you have the story. So I'm gonna call my friend JC, who also does this work. And it's also about leaning on each other. Right. If I if I don't have the veteran story, because that's not my hammer. My hammer is, you know, drinking daddy, um, my my mama. I had some some death when I was 16, things like that. That's my hammer. Your hammer is different. But I know JC's hammer. So I'm gonna call JC and hey, JC, I need your hammer. So I, I thought about that when you were speaking. The other thing I think about is staying curious. If you are new and you've never done this before, open your mind and stay curious. Ask questions and listen. Listen more than you speak. 
Um, that's my other one. Um, that may be a little bit of an old AA thing coming through also in recovery, but right, that's what we're doing is blending them. So stay curious in the story of the people that you're working with. It'll help you with removing the assumptions a little bit is just to stay curious and open-minded. And what you don't know, admit. Don't try to bluff people in the streets. We're smart. <laughs> so just be honest. Be honest with what you know and what you don't know. Um, because we, we know a good game. I think on that point, uh, I know that for me personally, um, I had to learn to be that transparent person because most of us who live in more privilege, you know, live with illusion a lot. And, and there's a lot of illusion that gets stripped away when people are homeless, experiencing OUDs and, and other trauma, et cetera. Um, and so that being real, being that transparent, because people who have experienced trauma actually have developed the sixth and seventh sense maybe about what's real and what's not, because you're trained to observe people very, very carefully if trauma is part of your story, because you have to know who to trust and who not to, right? So taking off on that, we do talk a lot about trauma in the toolkit and also the connection between trauma or the correlation between trauma and substance misuse. I wonder if one or two of you might just say a little bit more about your understanding of, of that correlation that exists. Um, maybe I can start on, on this side. Um, of that question or of that experience. I mean, when I, when I returned home from uh, the service, um, Vietnam era army veteran, um, I had a lot of issues that I did not know how to deal with. So I, of course, um, utilized drug and alcohol to kind of anesthetize, uh, uh, change my reality. Uh, so I wouldn't have to deal with it so much. So I could kind of be normal, or at least what I pictured or what I thought was normal. Now, of course, over time, it tends to create more trauma and more drama, and the, the, the pit of addiction gets deeper and deeper. And there you are, real, you know, coming to a realization that <clears throat> I'm now so deep in this hole, I don't know how one person can't just get out of it. I mean, I, I, I felt like I had failed everything and I had tried so many different ways. Self-medicating did at one time work. I know that. I know what people who are addicted uh, go through when they're all of a sudden you're telling them that you're going to have to stop using something that at one time worked perfectly for you probably only the first few times, but other than that, it worked. And that's your memory. And that's what we always kept trying to get back to. And, but that never realizes. So in terms of the connection, especially when we talk about homelessness and addictions, uh, opioid addictions, it, 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 um, to focus on that, everybody who is homeless, is dealing with a trauma. And there's even a hierarchy of traumas that you deal with. Let's just imagine if you were homeless and you had a child with you, or you're homeless and you're a, uh, you suffer from PTSD from, from combat, or you, you're homeless and you're female and you suffer PTSD from uh, sexual trauma and you got a child. Uh, I promise you, you're going to find anything there is to smooth that process, to blur that sharp edge of life that you are watching every moment that you survive through that. I mean, it is horrendous. So there's always not only a correlation, it's almost a, necess almost a necessity. It's almost a need for them to have something that they can rely on immediately to relieve them of some of that stress, pain, and drama that they have to deal with every moment of every day. So, so understanding the function that that plays is so important is what I'm hearing you say, which is why sometimes in motivational interviewing, we'll say, you know, what do opiates do for you, right? 
And then of course, a follow-up question might be, and what are the downsides? And, and as a way of trying to tease out the fact that there are some good things. We, we seek solutions everywhere. Anyone else wanna say a little bit more about this or? I wanted to share my own experience um, yeah. with how and why I dealt with trauma with substances. It's because it's generally generationally what has happened in my family. My father was segregated till he was 28 years old in Texas and he answered his trauma with a drink. So when I had trauma, I answered mine with a drink. So part of it is what I learned. There's generational trauma specifically in my family. I still, we still have the, the land owned by the people who used to own us and it's still alive and breathing. And so I still, you know, I, I learned how to deal with it the way I watched other people deal with it. And I had to relearn that. Um, and we asked people to do that solo without a family unit and it's difficult. And so I just always did what I watched. I, I, I didn't know any different. So Ken, I'm going to share just a really brief um, story about, about, about recognizing and realizing I had trauma. Um, I was still in active addiction uh, and I was, but I was trying to get out um, and I was in college and I was working on my bachelor's at that time. Um, and I was, I was doing a summer course and it was called deviant behavior. And um, of course that appealed to me because I knew, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff I was doing was probably deviant behavior. And anyway, the course was great. Um, and at the end, our final was to draw basically a large flow chart of your family um, and identify not by name, but by family member, sort of everybody who had experienced or, you know, kind of showed the deviance that we had talked about in the course. And so I did a bang up job. I felt really proud of what I'd brought to my instructor, brought it in and, and I was standing behind her. I just remember this so clearly. I was standing behind her thinking, yeah, man, I, I've nailed this. She rolled it out. It was on a butcher paper. She rolled it out. She was looking at it. Not the, she took a long time and I you know, got a little nervous, but I knew I had done good work. And then she turned to me and she had the most shocked look on her face. And she took my hands, you know, she put my hands in hers like this. And she didn't say anything about my paper. She said, tell me that you're in counseling for this. And I, I had no idea until that moment that I had been raised in a horrifically deviant environment and that my lifestyle and the things that I knew and understood, they weren't normal. Um, and in fact, they were very traumatic, many of them. Um, and, and one of the problems I think that, that those of us who are trauma survivors have is that, you know, there's a lot of trauma. And in our work, we're exposed to all kinds of incredibly horrific trauma stories. And I used to compare the things that happened to me to my brothers and sisters who were sharing their trauma with me. And I'd be like, oh my God, that's trauma. I don't have that. But the truth is, it doesn't matter where you get the trauma, how you pick that trauma up. Once you have trauma, you have a brain change. And now what's left for you to do is to figure out how you can deal with the trauma responses that are going to come your way. And I think a lot of us have spent a good portion of our lives first, totally ignorant and unaware that that's even happening to us. And then you know, I've spent 21 years now and counting trying to identify all the trauma triggers in my life and figure out strategies and ways that I don't let them um, become harmful like they did uh, in, in active addiction. Even you, uh... Well, it, it's such a heartbreaking thing to hear, and yet it illustrates so vividly what we hear from so many people who experience trauma and don't know what the alternative is, that they consider it normal. And they're shocked when they find out that other people haven't had similar life experiences, right? The other piece about trauma is it's unspeakable. We're not supposed to talk about it. We certainly, in our society, especially trauma that happens within the home, which is where most trauma happens, 
And, and so we don't talk about it. We're only beginning to find language and be able to talk about it. And, and so when we say trauma informed, which is a, a big piece of the toolkit, we're obviously not talking about doing trauma therapy and going into the depths of people's trauma. That would be re-traumatizing, but we are needing to acknowledge it and make some sort of statement that acknowledges that that's not the way it is for everybody. And, and there are different ways to do that. But just to say that much and acknowledge that what has happened uh, without going into the details is, is a huge part of being trauma informed. And then it's also creating opportunities for people to have other life experiences that kind of counter that. Um, this, Ken, yeah, please. sorry, there was one, just one additional thing, you know, around trauma, and I, I think it's it's a really important one because when when um, I heard it, it it truly changed my life. And this is this is it. Um, you know, we take on, we internalize with with all of our stigma, the things that we've done and the things that have happened to us, and all of the guilt and shame from our lifestyle and you know, the things that, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda. Um, but what's important to understand is that while you're responsible for the things that you've done in your life, absolutely you are. If you are a trauma survivor, in some ways, it's not your fault. And again, I'm going to say that you're still responsible for the things that you've done. And, you know, you're not going to get out of that. But what I'm trying to help you understand is that when you recognize that it's really not your fault and that you know you hadn't been aware that these things were happening in your head until you were made aware, the, the relief that that brings, when I heard that, it was the first time in really in my recovery and probably in the last 40 years that I was able to look in the mirror and not hate that guy looking back at me. And I don't love that guy yet, but I, I like him now. And, and um, you know, I think, I think I'm going to end up loving this guy, uh, but it's still going to take time. That's the impact of trauma. I want to take all of that and state a claim that we make in the toolkit, and that is recovery is possible. And by that, I mean recovery from trauma, recovery from OUD and other substance use, trauma from mental health conditions, or excuse me, recovery from, uh, recovery from homelessness, recovery from all manner of things that make our lives challenging. And I just wonder if each of you could say a bit, you know, so what's the big deal about recovery? And, and uh, what, but particularly, what is it that helps people as providers of care helps you move towards recovery and also what sometimes might hinder what by what we do uh, hinder you from moving towards recovery what what are your thoughts on that wow what is my life without recovery um, I wouldn't be here today I'm grateful for the opportunity to recover um, and, and and I think we also need to I love the way you put that Ken all of the things that we recover from because every single one you listed I could have raised my hand for. Um, recovered from uh, sexual trauma, recovered from a uh, drinking daddy, <laughs> recovered from her own alcoholism. So I feel like there's layers to recovery, right? And I've recovered over the last 11 years and years in different layers of my life. Um, I'm also somebody who stayed married to a husband who drank for eight of the years I stayed sober. And I had to recover from that just about three and a half years ago. So it happens in layers. Um, and that it's possible makes, it, and I like the layering effect because it makes me not have to consume it all at once, that I don't have to try and transform my life instantaneously in all the areas that maybe this week, this year, I'm going to work on my alcohol. And, you know, three years after that, I worked on my financial recoveries and I've had to heal from some um, physical stuff due to my addictions. And so I like the layering effect. It feels like it's more of a journey and a process. You know, recovery is a journey. There's no destination. We're not at the end. Um, I think we're always recovering. And so I, 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 it's recovery is everything, I think, and it makes it possible. I am someone also who spent at the age of 16 years old when my friends were murdered 
instead of telling me I was sad, they said I was depressed. And to be honest, I grabbed it like a, like a hook, line and sinker. And I became by, they, they diagnosed me with um, illnesses and I, I, I bought them is my opinion of that. And I do know and recognize that there are definitely mental disorders. My sister's schizophrenic that are not the same as mine. Um, but I wish somebody would have taught me how to deal with my emotions and nobody did that for me. And so I just ran this course of life, but nobody told me I could have recovered from that, that at 17 years old, if someone would have said, Hey, Raquel, I know your friends have been murdered and this is going to be really, really difficult. And I'm sorry, you've picked up a bottle or whatever you've used, but you know, you can overcome this. You know, that nobody ever said that to me. I'm not joking. Nobody. I went into five institutions five weeks. I probably spent three months of my life institutionalized and nobody told me what was possible for me and that I could recover from this and I could participate in it. And that, that really honestly is when my life started to transform is when I knew I could participate and that I didn't have to wait for something to fall upon me before I was going to be better. Um, because I had waited for years for that, um, and drank through three, through my first three kids that way, hoping something would happen. But when I realized I could and you empowered me with an opportunity to recover, I have never picked up a drink since. And so the opportunity and the possibility of life instead of the the old story and that, like you said, sitting in that trauma, you know, I I am someone who's healed from grave traumas in her life. Um, Not that I don't acknowledge them. I just don't live in them anymore. And that's been huge for me. Wow, Raquel, (laughs) I'll tell you what, between you and Steve, um, I love you guys. Steve, you don't have to worry about loving yourself, man. I, you got enough people to love you. We'll love you until you can love yourself, man. Um, recovery for me and my perspective is it's about being in remission from something. And, you know, I've got this experience where part of it was recovery from alcohol and drugs. And then I've got this next phase of my life where recovery became a clinical thing. It became uh, like you, you dealt with symptoms of disease and you didn't, you weren't cured. You, what you would get would be remission. And so I started to see these conflicting ideas now coming together as to what am I doing? What is it accomplishing for me to, uh, to recover? What does it look like? How do I explain that to somebody who's on that leading edge and and wants to take that step, which, you know, I found was probably the hardest part of recovery is that first step. But I started to be able to explain to them that uh, like a disease, like any disease, let's just say you had uh, diabetes. And we used to use this analogy all the time in AA, you have diabetes, um, as long as you are looking after your diet and, and you get your insulin on time, guess what? You're in remission. But if you're going to go out and start pounding back sugar and, and, and you know, uh, Mars bars and whatever else you're going to hit, you know, guess what? You're going to relapse. You're going to, you're, you're going to have some problems. Um, and I think when you bring things back to basic common sense, I mean, I think the one thing that always scared me from recovery was that I would walk in there and everybody would know everything except me. They'd already like, they already read the book, you know, they already had all these thoughts and, and what made this work and, and why they were sober. And they were, well, they were perfect people. As a matter of fact, when I first went into recovery, somebody told me they had 10 years without a drink or drug. I would say, you're a liar. <laughs> There's no way you cannot exist without alcohol and drugs. Not in my life, not people like me or where I came from. Boy, did, did people like Raquel and Steve burst my little bubble. You know, you ain't special just because you had a hard time, you know. But I I believed one thing, though, when they told me that it's different for everybody because we don't take the same course, that your recovery is going to look a little different than mine, that you're going to realize some things that, that I'll never be able to see. 
But the main present that I got from recovery was I didn't have to live in the past anymore and I wasn't afraid of the future. And when I told people that, that was the one thing that everybody had in recovery. Wow, you guys, both, it's just, uh, yeah, I think about my own sort of recovery journey and, you know, um, and I, you know, in a way this is, this is really relevant for folks who are going to work with people who have an opioid use disorder and are out on the street because, you know, I, I didn't come into recovery sort of willingly. Um, I didn't even know what that was. And, and frankly, um, you know, the, the active using community, they don't view recovery with a very positive light. Um, and I think, it, you know, it has to do with the fact that, you know, we know it's there and we probably should be doing it, but we just, you know, we'd rather party. Um, I came into my recovery through symptom reduction. I, it's the only way I can put it. I was dope sick all the time. I had overdosed three different times. I knew it was just a matter of time. I couldn't, I couldn't navigate one foot in front of the other anymore. I just, I didn't know where to turn. And, and frankly, I had, you know, a lot of suicidal ideation at the time as well. Um, and when I say I came for symptom reduction, I basically showed up at a methadone clinic and said, I can't do this anymore and I don't know what to do, uh, but I can't be sick anymore. Um, and so I started on the medication and it wasn't a couple of years in symptom reduction sort of land where, you know, I began to bump up against recovery. Um, but but the goal for me was to get away from being sick. And I want to, I want to, I want to move that, that whole piece, because if, if you are working with individuals who have an opioid use disorder, and let me just say, as an example, you, you know, you have a housing first program, um, and you're really hoping to, you know, to move Bob into a housing first program. And, and, you know, you don't feel like Bob is real interested in recovery um, and that, you know, um, you know, Bob hasn't shown an interest in, in any even symptom reduction. He just wants to continue on. Um, you know, do you, do you, how do you support that person, right? Um, and what I would tell you um, around the, you know, the, the use is, we know that the struggle for, for, particularly for folks who have opioid use disorder, is this wicked cycle of well, sick, well, sick. And what folks need to understand is when you're in those cycles, it doesn't matter whether or not you have an apartment. It doesn't matter whether or not you have, this is your third housing first assignment apartment. And it looks like you're going to mess this one up too. It's, it doesn't matter because we're sick. And we'll do almost anything not to be sick anymore. So when you are seeing folks who, you know, are, are acting um, in ways that, that you know are jeopardizing their, their housing, um, it, it, what we don't want to do is throw the baby out with the bathwater. The last thing a person in that situation needs is to find out that you know, you're no longer welcome in this apartment. Because if we can put a roof over their head and we can begin to build a community around them, listen, four walls and a roof do not make home. That makes a house. What makes home is community and people who care and a place to be safe. You've heard everybody talk about this, right? It's, that's what makes us home. And if we throw people out of that home and that community at the time when they need us the most, imagine what that does to their hope. Imagine what that does to their self-respect and their own dignity. It just crushes it. And so I'm not asking folks to just continually give 
you know, folks a pass on inappropriate behavior. But I am saying that if you, particularly if you have somebody struggling with an opioid use disorder and it just doesn't seem to be making sense to you how they're behaving and acting, it's almost certainly a result of that crazy, well sick cycle um, and how that consumes almost every waking moment for them. Stephen, thanks for responding to one of the questions that came up in the chat box uh, specific to Housing First. I'm also reminded that um, if it's Housing First, people should not be asked to leave due to their use, but they might be asked to leave related to the behaviors related to their use. And that's an important distinction. I know you're getting a lot of airtime right now, Stephen, but I'm gonna ask you a pointed question. In the, in the toolbox, and this is more about stigma, in the toolbox, there's a quote attributed to you and you say, drugs didn't kill me. It was the stigma that almost killed me. Fentanyl never killed me because I knew the risks of fentanyl. Would you please say more about that and what you meant by emphasizing the stigma? And sure. other you, please, afterward. Yeah, so um, we know that, you know, one of the primary reasons folks don't come for treatment is because of stigma. And, you know, that's very true for me. Um, and, you know, I, 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 had, I, had all, I had all kinds of stigma. Um, you know, I had stigma against other uh, substance users who were using methamphetamine instead of heroin. Or I had, you know, stigma around, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, having, to, having to deal with, you know, something like the pharmacy. Or uh, th there's so much stigma um, that I don't want you to know. Because if you don't know, you can't stigmatize me and you can't hold me accountable for those things. So as I'm, you know, kind of moving towards my, my recovery, um, and again, it just totally un, unknown to me, um, I, I had to overcome this, this, hor this horrible, um, shame and guilt uh, that, that I carried. Um, and and it, it, it was because of my substance use. It, I had done a lot of bad things in my, you know, in my addictive lifestyle, but it was really, I was shamed because of the messaging, the stigmatizing messaging that came out of the war on drugs. And we're still doing that, right? We're showing pictures of people overdosed in their cars. I get it, that sells newspapers and it's a shocking look. I, I understand all that. But it's also exploitive and, and it adds to the stigma. Think about this. Would you, if you saw your, your family members in that car, would you even admit that? Of course not. That's courtesy stigma. It, it is associated with the people around the person who's using. That's how deep and, and prevalent pernicious stigma can be. So in my recovery, I had to overcome that level of stigma. And you have to understand, I'm a healthcare provider. I was a, I was a nationally registered paramedic. I, I understand uh, medicine, healthcare, primary healthcare, and behavioral healthcare. I know the stigma. Um, and I know what that, what that can do to folks. And in order to overcome that, I was so sick and I was so ready to kill myself that it didn't matter anymore what you all thought of me because I needed to take care of me. It was one of the first times really, you know, substance use is all about you. Um, but this is the one time when I could really deep dive into myself and, and save myself rather than put myself at risk, you know, for, for the substance use that I was doing. So I hope that helped explain it. Um, it is a massive thing to overcome. And I'm not sure that, that many of us are able to do it. And it's also why today I wear all this stuff on my sleeves. I'll tell you everything you want to know about what it's like to go to prison, what it's like to have a, a heroin addiction, what it's like to, you know, I'll tell you whatever, because my worst liabilities today are my greatest assets. And I know that they're helping others stand up, 
normalize these conditions and actually be able to look in the mirror once again and like the person looking back. You know, Steve, if I can say something real quick about stigma, uh, from my perspective, it came from two fronts. I had a stigma initially from my family, uh, of course, you know, being a black man in the South, uh, you, you are conditioned to have a stigma or that layer of protection, that cloak, so to speak, um, for the family. And then I had the stigma that was brought on about my, but are brought on through my military uh, association. Um, and I'll start with that one first, because in the military, if upon your discharge, let's say you're getting ready to get out ETSing, and you happen to mention to your uh, platoon sergeant there that you're having bad dreams and thoughts and, you know, I'm not sleeping well and, uh, you know, I've been kind of explosively angry and you might not be able to discharge when you thought you were getting ready to leave. Not only that, you might discharge with a medical discharge instead of just a regular honorable discharge. Now, I don't know if that's something that would hurt you in the future. I really don't. I haven't seen a lot of issues that befall someone who has a medical discharge. But what I do know is that person who has their medical discharge feels like it's something wrong with them. Feels like I need to not let anybody know that I have a medical discharge, you know, because what does that say? Is that called, does that mean I'm, I was afraid? Does that mean I was a coward? I didn't fulfill my duties? As a black man growing up in the South, we, nobody in the neighborhood, there was no such thing as mental illness. You never saw it in my environment, ever. And if you did, it was just Uncle Bobby uh, is, is just a little ill today. He'll be all right once his ass gets out and gets a job. Excuse my language. But the fact of the matter is, I didn't even realize that that stigma that I had was just a layer of protection for myself, for my family. And it was so conditioned that that's what made it difficult to relieve myself from it was because it was a routine. And, 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 and it was just part of that natural instinct Instinctive almost. It was learned behavior, but still, I still to this day uh, will, uh, you know, try to uh, uh, make a person who has a medical discharge, make them land a little softer by telling them, you know, it's not that big a deal. We're going to work on this. We're going to help you. Even though I have no idea if it hurt them in the first place. So I do understand stigma. Uh, and, and I do know that education about the particular things that we're discussing here is the solution and or the treatment for stigma. And I, I just wanna say, I think of stigma as a close cousin to racism. And I'd like us to turn our attention for a bit to why is it important in our work to use a racial equity lens and what are some anti-racist practices that we can engage in uh, in our work, not only interpersonally, perhaps, but also looking at the larger system. Just curious, uh, Raquel, I'm going to invite you to take a, a start there, if you're willing. Uh, we haven't heard from you for a bit. Yeah, um, Anti-racist practices. This is a really big challenging question for me. I recovered in an all-white community. Um, there's 2,200 people in my town, and there are three people of color. I am one of the three. And so very interesting lens for me to speak on. Um, you know, I, the first thing I did, I was going to a church here and I handed a pastor a book. Um, it's Austin Channing's book. And I asked him to read. So I think I'm going to go with that. When I ask about anti-racist actions you can take, you can read, you can read, you can ask questions. Um, um, I think finding um, a safe space to, um, I don't know, I have people in my inbox all the time just asking questions. Again, back to the staying curious. 
Um, I think the best anti-racist right now, we have this beautiful library. Black people are speaking, you know, um, people of color are speaking. So I would advise you to listen. Um, we often think we know something, but we don't. Even, you know, being biracial myself, I've learned even myself quite a bit. It's been fascinating this last year watching my children read books um, beyond what was done, what they were taught in school and seeing them challenge um, and learn for themselves. So self-education is really important. You know, what you do in between the session, um, therapy in between the session, or, you know, what you do in between the webinar, you know, what you do after this, the book you pick up, the article you read, the stuff you do in between, that's what matters. You can sit in a thousand of these classes and you can hear, but I think it's that stuff you do on your own time that enriches um, that can, that can actually honestly enrich your experience more. I, I just want to say, mm. can I, can I say, mm? can I get another? Mm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Education is, is definitely important. Um, you know, I have to say for me that Racism, well, not racism, racial equity is important because I think we need to understand what kind of equity we're talking about. You know, I don't, and, and Raquel, this is, this is from you, because you taught me something. You know, I don't really want what somebody from another race has, just, just so to speak. I mean, I, I do pretty good where I am and what I have. What I want is I want the environment to be conducive to me having the same opportunity, the understanding, the, the compassion that everyone else is getting, you know? And, and I don't think that's an individual thing as much as it is a social construct, as much as it is a system thing. You know, when I'm looking at equity in mental health uh, and behavioral health, I look at the fact that most people who deal with people of color don't really understand the, the little differences that will connect them to help them to, to be able to help that person because they, that they don't know. And then I look at the inequity in, in how many people of color are in psychology or psychiatry. And probably because we never had that problem to start out with. It was not even mentioned in the family. You, you don't go to the mental health people while you're crazy. And so, so there's that inequality of, of not enough people getting educated in cultural differences in mental health treatment and therapy. And they I, think, also, I, I love that, JC, I just want to do this with you too, because I think what you said, I was going to bring it up and I didn't, so I'm glad you did, which is, I think people assumed I want what they have. Yeah. You know, you think that I want what you've given, what you're offering me, and what if I don't? And a good example is I had a client I was working with who was experiencing homelessness. And, you know, my thought was the first thing is to, she needs a roof over her head. It was not her priority. So the other thing is to quit assuming that what is an urgency for us is an urgency for others. Hers was to stay out of places that triggered her. And every time she walked into a sober home, she was reminded of jail. She couldn't live in a sober home. They set her up in bunk beds like this in that sober home and it triggered. So basically, to be honest, she has experienced one year living mm -hmm. methamphetamine free on the street, talking to me like this on a phone because she can connect with me all the time. And so, you know, assuming my assumption was she should get her off the street. I got to get her off the street. No, actually, that wasn't it. And she's doing just fine. Does she want to eventually? Absolutely. We're getting her there when she's mm -hmm. ready so it can last. You know, she doesn't want to be, you know, keep going in and out of places. So I agree. I think we do have to make sure that we don't assume that what we have, people have to take from it. Like, I, I don't necessarily, I, I want to create my own. Where's the autonomy in that? I have the power within me to create my own life. I don't need you to push your life upon me. You know, that, that tells me also the education aspect of this 
isn't just the professionals who need to be educated, but also the patients. Because I remember my first uh, uh, experience with a psychologist who happened to be East Indian Indian. And because I did not believe he understood anything about my culture, my socioeconomic standing, my military background, my none of these things, I did not believe he could help me. And then some other person who was much more open and educated about mental health recovery said to me, well, what did you expect when you went into his office? That he would be a doctor of J.C. Smith psychology? You know, well, when you go to your doctor for diabetes, J.C., did he have to have diabetes too? Did he have to eat the same stuff you ate in order for you to be able to, to get any help from him? So I needed to be educated as well. There, there is that gap, you know, and I think that's, that's what peers and that's what outreach can get us to is that nice wave of education. I uh, just want to chime in here. I think so much of that education, of course, is for people like myself, a white male who has lived with incredible uh, protection, privilege, opportunity that I always just considered as normal until I learned that that's not true. It's kind of like trauma. You know, you, you think that white dominant culture is normal and you live in it if you're like me. And, and only in the last number of years with the uprising that we're experiencing of knowledge and understanding, uh, are we be, am I beginning to understand, and many people like myself, um, how, how pervasive white dominant cultural characteristics are in all of what we do in our mental health systems, behavioral health, in healthcare, and, and beyond. And so this is obviously a complicated issue, but you know, each of you, Raquel and Joel and others I've spoken with, know, know it in your bones what we're talking about when we talk about generational trauma from racism, from insidious trauma, you know, related to racism and, 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 and just the, the ongoing uh, pounding, <laughs> if you will, uh, that's it, sometimes in the background and not so much of, of how it impacts your lives. And so one of the things I would challenge to everybody in this call today is to, to recognize that it's all of our responsibilities to be anti-racist and it's everybody's responsibility to work further for racial equity. And we can do that in many small and also larger ways. Uh, and again, in the toolkit, you'll see that elaborated upon more, but um, yeah, important stuff. And it's actually, I, I'm noticing one person said, I think we need to destigmatize trauma when it relates to adjusting to societal trauma from racism. And uh, I think that's a really useful approach and, and comment on there. I, let me just say too, I, I'm so appreciating having the opportunity to see a lot of the comments and questions in the Q&A. Um, I realize we can't get to everybody's, but um, I did want to turn to one more topic for us to at least briefly comment on, and that is the concept of harm reduction related to homelessness, opiate use disorder, and what role does harm reduction play and why is it important? Well, I can dive into this one. Um, you know, we use harm reduction in all kinds of things. Um, and Part of the challenge has been that, you know, we, we tried to come at particularly at things like substance use um, as either um, you use or you are abstinent. And there's a huge amount of gray in between those two. And um, if, if part of the, you know, part of the challenge that we've had is that we've been coming at this, this effort um, in a really punitive way. Uh, and, you know, we, 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 have, we have locked up half the darn country around substance use. Um, and, you know, many of us who have been, who have used substances, who, 
you know, who even some of us who have been addicted, um, we can go on and we can do great things, but it's not going to happen if every time we turn around, you put us in prison because we've relapsed or you've, you've um, barred all of the access to the things that help us uh, recover um, beyond just our substance use, right? A cessation of substance use. But if I can't get a job and if I can't find housing, I'm in a pretty bad set of circumstances. And I can tell you as a person who's misused substances, you put me on the street like that, I can't guarantee that I'm going to remain sober till the end of the day, let alone till the end of the week. And I can't really, I can't, um, I get it. I get it for folks. So when we think about harm reduction, you know, there, there is no sort of official um, description of what harm reduction is. But for me, what it says is that it's a strengths-based way of coming at, uh, you know, support um, and understanding. You're suspending your judgment. Um, you, you know, you you've you've added some tolerance to your life. It may not be what you you like, um, but it's not your business what what they like. Mm -hmm. The goal is really to reduce the harm for the period that we're going to be in in active use or you know, whatever, whatever it is, the behavior is that, that is occurring that is potentially harmful. And for those of us who are supporting our brothers and sisters out there, trying to, you know, trying to do the things like find some housing, get some ID, you know, here's some bus passes. Um, you know, for us, the, the, the whole point is to make life just a little less harmful for folks until they're able to make their own decisions about whether or not they want to recover, what that recovery looks like, and to the extent um, that they want to cease their substance use. There's a lot of folks who've used cannabis all their lives, never had an issue. There's a lot of folks who use cannabis and develop a cannabis use disorder. So harm reduction uh, really is, a, you know, on a scale. I mean, it's sort of a continuum. Um, and I, I come at harm reduction today um, as, as probably the prominent way that I want to engage with people. I want to support them. I don't want to judge them. Um, if they need some additional information about recovery, oh, you know, I'll give it to them. But I'm not going to pound them down and punitively punish them because I don't agree with what they're doing. Steve, I... I got one real short little comment I want to make about harm reduction. And I know you know where I come from on it. I mean, from way back when, because I came out of the recovery community, it was all or nothing. You know, it was basically abstinence. Don't do nothing else. And I railed on that. And then I met some people who were going through harm reduction therapy, who were utilizing other substances to help them with the substances that they were recovering from. And I learned tremendously from those experiences and those people. But I'm going to say this one thing, the one thing that may had the most gravity that, that struck me the hardest about harm reduction was in the VA clinic. I won't say where, who, when, why, or any of that. There was someone, a doctor, who had gotten a patient who wanted to uh, withdraw a titrate off of opiates, off of, I believe, it may have been methadone. It may have been. Um, and they were willing to do it in a very controlled way. They wanted to do it with a doctor's uh, support. And they talked to me quite a bit. And they came to me one day and they said, well, I, found, I got the titration uh, uh, schedule from the doctor and he wants me to titrate off of all of this stuff in three months. And I was, what? <laughs> now, I didn't have to go through that, but I'm like, oh, that can't be right. 
there's something wrong with that. And so I, I went and spoke to some other doctors who everybody had a different idea. And I'm like, how the hell can you do this? And nobody has the standard or the same kind of, you know, I'm not a doctor, but there's something truly wrong with that. And uh, of course, the guy ended up doing it on his own. Thank God. Because he probably would have died if he tried that in three months. I don't know. I really don't because I, I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is from talking to four different doctors about that, I got four different viewpoints of harm reduction. And I'm talking about mental health doctors. Folks, um, I lo- go, please, Raquel. Uh, yeah, I won't be long. I want to say harm reduction is I love what Steven said about your way in. I work with people all over the time and I live in an affluent area, so I can work with both, right? I work with both affluent and those who are experiencing homelessness. And if it's an all or nothing thing, we lose people. So I've worked with people for three to four, five months to a year before they're ready. And it's about relationship. It's not about results. It's about relationship. So I think as you're out there working um, in the communities, remember relationship first and the rest will follow. That's our responsibility. When I work in the field and I'm out there talking, I work on relationship first. What, what a wonderful uh, way to summarize all of the complexity that y- you're right, that healing and recovery almost always happens in the context of a kind, loving, caring, compassionate relationship. And it's because we, we need each other and we mimic each other and we uh, find sustenance in each other. And it's the rare person who can do that on their own and sustain it. Um, So I'm going to turn this back to- Well, and the other thing is we were never supposed to. We were never supposed to do it on alone. That's the illusion. That's the grand illusion is that we were ever supposed to do this alone. Indeed. Thank you all. Jen, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I um, we have been receiving just amazing feedback through this, saying that you know, commending you for sharing your stories and experiences, and because it sounded like their stories and their experiences, and it's always wonderful the power of storytelling. I know this is not traditional. Let's just talk about the toolkit. Let's talk about things because you know we don't you know we don't want to be talked at. We want to be talked with, and I do feel like we got some great feedback in the Q and A about people feel heard um, and they feel supported in this work. And so I uh, will hope all the attendees join me in a round of applause for our presenters. We just really couldn't thank you enough for being here and sharing your expertise. Um, So real quick, I will will wrap it up with a a couple of housekeeping. We added the evaluation link in the chat. We really appreciate your time in letting us know um, how you felt about the webinar. Completing that, you'll be directed to a certificate of participation that you can add your name to and print off. Um, a reminder, we don't at, uh, offer CEUs for this, but um, I know some people turn this in for their own CEUs. We will have the slides um, and the recording of the webinar up on our website in about a week. If you have any other questions, there's lots of questions we're gonna try to work on and follow up after the webinar. If you haven't gotten yours in, email us at info at hhrctraining.org. Reach out to our team, it wants to hear from you. We want to help connect you with more resources. And again, we hope that you explore our website and download the toolkit which is available again, hhrctraining.org. Oh, I probably miss, yeah, misspelled that as I'm trying to talk and put something in there. Join us, explore the toolkit and let us know what you think. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your time and your participation today. And I hope everybody has a good rest of your week. Thank you so much.